Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, the Prime Minister's strained relationship with business hasn't been helped by a leaked Home Office document which points to a hard-line approach to immigration after Brexit. The paper, which isn't government policy yet, proposes a series of measures restricting unskilled European migrants. Here's our political editor, Faisal Islam. Finally, some details for employers of EU labour, such as Oxfordshire chicken farmer James Hook, a leak of a crackdown on low-skilled migrant labour after Brexit. I think this will cause a massive problem for my business. We employ nearly 2,000 people here in the UK. About 25% of these people come from mainly Eastern Europe and they're a very reliable part of our long-term workforce. To get new people to come for a job for two years I think would be impossible and it would throw into jeopardy our whole business for the future. A million EU workers fill lower-skilled jobs in Britain. Business groups describe the plans as catastrophic. In the first Prime Minister's questions of the new term, it wasn't Jeremy Corbyn asking about this migration leak, but the Scottish National Party, the PM defending the approach. The Prime Minister must stop dancing to the tune of our right-wing backbenchers and apologise, apologise for the disgraceful treatment her government has shown migrants in the UK. There is a reason for wanting to ensure that we can control migration. It is because of the impact that that migration can have, that net migration can have, on people, on access to services, on access on infrastructure, but crucially, crucially, it often hits those at the lower end of the income scale hardest. The 81-page leaked Home Office document outlines a framework for post-Brexit immigration that should benefit not just the migrants themselves, but also make existing residents better off. It proposes that highly skilled occupations could get a permit lasting three to five years, and for those in other occupations, just up to two years. And it also proposes a reasonable but specific income threshold for EU citizens to come to the UK. Ministers stress that this is an early draft of Home Office thinking, that it hasn't yet been discussed by the Cabinet. But they say they have a mandate for this general approach from the referendum. And it will mean that MPs have to vote through an immigration bill early next year to provide a general framework in UK law for immigration of EU citizens. But without numbers, thresholds, quotas, because that is a subject for the negotiation and for the report in a year's time from the Migration Advisory Committee. This process is bizarre, where we've got, we're getting all this discussion about immigration policy, when the Home Secretary herself has asked um, this independent body to come back to her with details, you know, with evidence about what immigration is needed. It's almost like the policy is being made on the hoof. <laughs> But the government continues to face domestic political pressures such as the public sector worker pay freeze, nurses protesting outside Parliament today. But here, there are nurses from EU countries too who feel a different sort of pinch. We're not sure about anything and then um, some people are happy about Brexit, some people are not happy about that and then um, it's not very nice because you can feel that maybe they don't want us to stay. Existing EU migrant workers such as Irene or at the chicken farm should be fine under government plans. The leak was about future EU arrivals. And the irony is that as the earning power of jobs in the UK slides with the declining sterling, EU migration is already falling. Legislation is coming nonetheless. Faisal Islam, Sky News. The Home Office has been accused of a mean and cynical immigration crackdown following the leak of a Brexit document which outlines plans to close the door to thousands of unskilled EU migrants. The Defence Secretary, Michael Fallon, says the government is just taking back control of immigration after the Brexit referendum. Now let's have a look at some of the details in the Home Office document. And much of the language uh, focuses on what immigration can do for Britain. It says, to be considered valuable to the country as a whole, immigration should benefit not just the migrants themselves, but also make existing residents better off. 
On the time frame, the document says, we are minded to grant those in highly skilled occupations and who have a contract of employment of more than 12 months a permit lasting three to five years. For those in other occupations, it may be up to two years. Earlier, the Defence Secretary, Sir Michael Fallon, told Sky News that the government will produce formal proposals later this year. When we leave in, uh, in, 19, uh, in 2019, then obviously free movement ends. So we have to set out new arrangements, uh, uh, setting out exactly how people who want to come and work here, how long they'll be able to do so, what rights they will have and so on. And we'll set out firm proposals for that later in the year. There's always a balance to be struck. We want to attract to this country and not shut the door on highly skilled people who want to come here and make a contribution to our society and put down roots here. And we've always welcomed people from, uh, from abroad who want to do that. But equally, we have to make sure that British companies also prepared to train and train up British workers, give them the opportunities too to our college leavers. So there's a balance to be struck here. Well, one of the European Parliament's Brexit officials, the German MEP Elmar Brock, told me that this could impact on the Brexit negotiations if it becomes official policy. I was shocked as I saw the language of this paper and the content of this paper, but it's still, as you said, rightly a paper of the Home Office, and I hope it will not become official uh, government policy, because we have to uh, find a sufficient progress in the question of citizens' rights financial obligation in the Irish question before we can start a second phase about to talk about the future relationship. And such a paper is, does not, is not helpful to create uh, credibility of the British uh, policy. And therefore, it would be a very difficult situation if this would become official policy of the United Kingdom. Well, joining me now is the chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee and uh, former Labour Cabinet Minister Yvette Cooper MP. Welcome to you indeed. Good morning. Uh, this is a leak. It's not an official document, although it has to be said it hasn't been denied uh, that it is a Home Office document. What do you make of it? Well, I think it's quite confusing and that probably does reflect the fact that ministers have not yet signed it off, as we're told, um, last night. I think there's, there's probably three uh, questions that, that arise from it. The first is what they actually are intending, because it's a bit confused about whether some of these measures are just for the transitional period, where they previously said they want no real changes to the current free movement arrangements during the transition. This now seems to be adding lots of different bureaucracy, will that actually work, and so on, or whether these are measures that are intended to apply beyond the transition period. So there's quite a bit of confusion about what actually the proposals really are. I think second is the question about are the government actually going to wait for the evidence and they have themselves asked the Migration Advisory Committee to look at the overall impact on the economy, on different sectors of the economy. I think that work is really important, should have started many months ago. They ought to wait for that before they come to any final conclusions. And the third is, there seems to be no recognition within this document that actually, in reality, there's going to be a lot of negotiations and trade-offs around immigration and trade. And those two things are going to end up being very linked. Nonetheless, there's some pretty clear principles stated in this document. The first is severe restrictions, really, on unskilled labour. The second is cap on the duration of time uh, that people in skilled jobs, including people working in the NHS, for example, could spend here. I mean, does Labour welcome both of those as taking back control? Well, I'm obviously not speaking for the Labour Party. Sure. I'm just speaking as the Home Affairs Select sure. Committee Chair. And we are halfway through an inquiry into immigration, so we'll be looking at exactly yeah. these sorts of issues. But again, I think it's not clear what, what they're actually proposing, because they talk, for example, about a two-year work permit for low-skilled workers. But it's unclear whether that is just yeah. a transitional arrangement before they then get a different kind of work permit afterwards, or whether it is that's the end and then people are supposed to return even if they might still be needed yeah. for a particular job. So we need a lot more answers from the Home Office But I mean, this sort of thing, from your about... point of view, given the Brexit vote, is it inevitable that there will be restrictions of this kind? Well, we know that. People want to see that immigration is important for Britain, but it also needs to be controlled and managed so that the system is fair. So there has to be an honest debate around the country about really what the impact of immigration is on the economy, the benefits of that, but also the way in which it needs to be managed. That does need to look at different skill levels as well, 
but it also needs to look at how this links to the overall trade arrangements, whether it's that's a free trade agreement or any single market access and so on, because those things are going to be linked. I mean, that the other, there aren't simple answers yeah, at this stage. No, 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 but I mean, the other thing the which uh, this document suggests is that the ability of families to unite in this country when uh, one member is working is going to be severely restricted. Is that something you'd support? I think it's really important that uh, that any immigration rules for any country do support families being able to stay together, and I think most people would agree with that. So it's but again, wrong what's but again, what's out. unclear in this document is: are they simply meaning that, for example, at the moment, actually EU citizens who come to Britain can bring more family members from outside the EU than UK citizens who are already here? So there is an anomaly in there that the Home Office has been wanting to correct for a long time to have the same arrangements for yeah. UK citizens. And and EU citizens. It's not clear whether the government is simply mm. referring to that anomaly or whether they've got new proposals in mind that would actually be very hard for families. Again, so many questions we just don't know the answer to at this stage. I mean, I get the, shock, the sense that, uh, you know, as someone who's been in government, you're not really shocked by this document. You see it as a discussion document and you, you see it as at least asking the right questions. Would that be fair? I think the, I think, no, there's a big question that is not considered at all in this, which is actually about what the relationship is going to be between this and the economic arrangements and the trade arrangements. And unless the government is honest about that, we're going to have a whole lot of problems further down the track. That's where they really start need, needed to start levelling with people, that whatever the immigration arrangements that we have are, are going to end up being linked in a negotiation to whatever the final trade deal is that we get. And there are going to be compromises that everybody's going I have to make. And it's also pretty clear, isn't it, that whatever restrictions we impose on European citizens, Euro European Union citizens here, are going to be reciprocated on British citizens wanting to work in the European Union. That's exactly right. And we've also got to be able to take account of what happens in different sections of the economy. And we know, for example, the NHS strongly depends on needing to have uh, people who have come here over very many years, worked in the NHS. And we also know that the important role that immigration has played in our economy over very many years. So that's why it's really important to have the evidence from the Migration Advisory Committee. My, my real concern about this document is it's going to rush to some sort of confused conclusions before we've actually got the evidence on which to have an honest and proper debate right across the country. People have really strong opinions on immigration. There's got to be an honest and thoughtful debate, not a kind of polarised shouting match. OK, uh, that's very clear. The Prime Minister has defended moves to restrict immigration from the European Union after a Home Office document outlining plans to close the border to thousands of unskilled EU migrants was leaked. Theresa May told the House of Commons at Prime Minister's questions that people want to see tighter controls on immigration as Britain leaves the EU. Overall immigration has been good for the UK, but what, what people want to see is control of that immigration. That's, I think, what people wanted to see as a result, want to see as a result of coming out of the European Union. We're already able to exercise controls in relation to those who come to this country from outside the, uh, the countries within the European Union. And we continue to believe as a government that it's important to have migra net migration at sustainable levels. We believe that to be the tens of thousands, because of the impact particularly has on people at the lower end of the income scale in depressing their wages. Uh, we've pulled out some excerpts from that leaked Home Office document. Much of the language focuses on what immigration can do for Britain. For instance, it says to be considered valuable to the country as a whole, immigration should benefit not just the migrants themselves, but also making existing residents better off. On the time frame, the document says we are minded to grant those in highly skilled occupations and who have a contract of employment of more than 12 months a permit lasting three to five years. And for those in other occupations, it may be up to two years. And although there aren't specific details, the plan suggests there might be rules on migrants' minimum income. It says we propose to introduce a reasonable but specific income threshold for EU citizens to come to the UK as a self-sufficient person to ensure that they have sufficient income to be able to support themselves. Well, our chief political correspondent, John Craig, is in Westminster for us this afternoon. Um, John, has the government slightly uh, revealed its hand in advance of these Brexit negotiations about what will happen afterwards? 
Well, the official explanation from Home Office insiders is that, in fact, these are draft proposals. These have not yet been agreed by ministers. But uh, the Prime Minister did nothing uh, in Prime Minister's questions to suggest it's not the government's thinking. You'll have noticed that the angle she was looking uh, when she gave that answer just now was not straight across at Jeremy Corbyn across the dispatch box, but to Ian Blackford, the uh, Scottish National Party leader, uh, in the corner of the chamber. He was the one who tackled uh, the Prime Minister on uh, the whole immigration issue today uh, on other, an, an earlier Home Office blunder where letter deportation letters were sent out to uh, a number of uh, EU nationals living in this country. And it was he who went on the attack on immigration rather than Jeremy Corbyn. Um, the only real... Mr Corbyn chose to go on McDonald's pay dispute, the pay cap and so on, and it was the SNP who went on this issue. The other Brexit question that came up in uh, PMQs was from Anna Soubry, question number one, the pro-Remain uh, former minister who uh, started off all terribly supportive and then uh, twisted the stiletto at the end of her question by accusing the government of a power grab this is this so-called uh, Henry VIII clause in the repeal bill, the withdrawal bill, uh, that MPs were attacking David Davis on yesterday. Um, on the reason the Labour Party have not really gone on the attack on Brexit today, well, two reasons really. One, there's a split in the party about what their policy on immigration should be. And secondly, on the whole issue of the... Uh, uh, the uh, withdrawal bill, that's a battle for an another day, according to uh, senior Labour sources after PMQs. John, thanks very much. Uh, well, let's get more on our top story today. That leaked Home Office document, which apparently shows that the government's considering how to limit European migration, EU migration, post-Brexit. Under those proposals, low-skilled workers would have to leave the UK after one or two years. Those in highly skilled occupations would be able to stay between three and five years. There'd be curbs on EU migrants bringing family members to join them in the UK. Uh, let's get the employer's view. Edwin Morgan is Director of Policy at the Institute of Directors. Edwin Morgan, a very good afternoon to you. Um, in those bullet points, uh, we didn't include some of what was in this document, in particular mm. around how the government would expect employers, you'll represent some of them or speak for some of them, employers who understandably would rather have relatively cheap labour from the European Union rather than go to the trouble and expense of training people who are indigenous to do the jobs that need to be done? Um, well, I really don't accept um, that premise. When we ask our members why they employ migrants, they don't say it at all. They say it's because they're the right person for the job. Um, and when we ask employers who already employ EU migrants uh, whether they also train British workers, they overwhelmingly say that they do. The, the issue with uh, the leaked paper that, that's come out today, and it, you know, it is a leak, so we're not getting too worked up about it, um, is that it does seem that it's, uh, it's a long way away from where we're going to need to get to in the Brexit negotiations that are happening at the moment. Um, the concern from, from our members at the moment is, is actually the EU workers they already have are feeling unsettled, are concerned about their employment status, um, and we're getting reports that actually EU workers are either leaving or considering leaving. Well, well, it, well, in that case, somebody's not doing their job properly, are they? Whether that's the media, whether it's the government, whether it's organisations like yours, because this is what will happen in the future, not retrospectively. Again, caveated with the fact it's a, a draft consultation document, not the real deal. Mm. Well, I mean, that's, that's not quite the case because uh, they haven't, the government has not come to an agreement with the EU uh, on you know, the future status of uh, these workers. Um, so, yeah, and this is meant to be being discussed um, at the moment in um, the rounds of talks that we've just had. Um, and we would have liked to see more progress uh, so far on that. Because it, it does matter, you know, even if you're here and you think there is a very good chance that you will be able to stay, um, the fact that it isn't settled, the deal isn't done, that you don't know what your future rights will be, is, is inevitably unsettling. Yeah, and indeed, from the most recent migration figures, there was some evidence, wasn't there, that people, some EU citizens, were going back to their countries of origin. So there seems to be some, some chilling effect exactly. there. Can I just go back to the point you made that your members do not, that they're making their choices on the basis of the right person for the job, mm. not on price. Yeah. A lot of people will shake their heads in disbelief at that idea. Mm. I mean, just because at a basic level, you know, why would a business employee somebody uh, more expensive than somebody cheaper it doesn't make any any, any economic mm. sense uh, that they, they they accept this idea 
that if you're a big business, you're a massive mm. net beneficiary from globalization. And a big current within globalization is people mm. from other parts of the European Union willing to come and do jobs that Brits do not want to do. Be open mm. about it. Well, I mean, I think at the moment the, the situation is that we have unemployment below 5%. There simply aren't a huge number of uh, British workers out there to fill these jobs. And, and you well, have. You know, which is why the ones that are in that 5% need mm. training. And that's going to take money. It'll take some taxpayers' money, but it might take some of yeah. your money too. Oh, absolutely. There, there is always room for, for more training. There are uh, lots of particular things that the government should be doing on apprenticeships. I mean, for example, I was talking to some of our members yesterday who were saying they were trying to engage with local schools and colleges on the design of apprenticeship courses because, of course, it, you know, it, it really matters uh, what they're being taught because that will then help them, uh, you know, get jobs. And, you know, and the businesses that are encountering resistance that uh, the colleges don't know how to engage or they don't want to engage. Um, so government needs to be pushing on those kind of things. That, that is absolutely true, but it also isn't in any way inconsistent with getting the right skills and the right people to do the right jobs. And some of those will have to come uh, from abroad because we have skill shortages in, in some areas and very low unemployment. We, so there aren't we, a lot of people we know, around. We know, don't we, Edwin? We know that there are some sectors where mm. it's simply supply and demand. You know, I don't know, school cleaners. If you mm. bring in school cleaners uh, from Poland, uh, who are willing to work longer hours and undercut indigenous workers. That's, that's not got anything to do with full employment. That's got everything to do with what Gordon Brown, the former Labour Prime Minister, said, what, seven or eight years ago, was necessitated British jobs for British workers. Well, I mean, the, the, I think the first thing to say is, yeah, I, I do talk to employers all the time. And the, the idea that they are not, uh, or they're trying not to employ British workers, just is, is utter nonsense. You know, they, they try you know, absolutely very, very hard to employ British workers. Are you sure? Um, I mean, the, we, we think of yes. one, famous, one famous sandwich retail chain, which didn't quite cleave to that view, I seem to remember. I mean, the, the, yeah, there may be uh, examples of, you know, bad employers, but, you know, that's... Yeah, that just happens in, in every sector. But I mean, the, the real thing is the, the question across the economy, you know, across low, you know, the hundreds of thousands, millions of different employers that, that there are. Um, and the situation really is, you know, it, it does really matter that unemployment is so low because the, the, the question is, if you were to try and drastically reduce immigration from the EU very quickly, that would leave massive skills shortages and massive skills gaps, and companies would not be able to fill them with British workers. Yeah, with the best in the world, the people just aren't there. Um, and then that would hold back the growth of those companies, and that would damage the, the other people, the British people who worked in those companies, and the economy in general. Edwin Morgan from the Institute of Directors. Appreciate your time this afternoon. Thanks a lot. It's a leaked document of an early draft, but the revelation of the government's thinking on immigration after Brexit has produced both political opposition and business concern. Today, ministers have been explaining why they believe low-skilled immigration from the EU should be restricted. Theresa May said free movement hurts some of the lowest-paid workers in the UK. But business leaders say EU workers are good for the economy. Here's our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. There in black and white, a plan for immigration after we leave the EU. Leaked ideas to answer the demand the Prime Minister believes millions made when they voted to go. Prime Minister, is your immigration policy going to hurt the economy? A draft of a tighter system of control that could come with its own costs. Overall immigration has been good for the UK, but what, what people want to see is control of that immigration. That's, I think, what people wanted to see as a result, want to see as a result of coming out of the European Union. We're already able to exercise controls in relation to those who come to this country from outside the, uh, the countries within the European Union. And we continue to believe as a government that it's important to have migra net migration at sustainable levels. The document from August says freedom of movement where unlimited EU citizens can come here will end when we leave. New arrivals after 2019 would have to register to stay long term. There'll be tighter rules for lower skilled workers to prioritise British employees, perhaps even with a cap on numbers. And for EU citizens who do come to the UK, it'll be harder to bring family along. So perfect. Right. This Birmingham food factory is already losing one Italian chef who's worried about Brexit. And boss Rosie Ginday is concerned Sorry. it will make it harder to attract new arrivals, the staff she needs. 
it would definitely hinder our job as an employer, but actually as a food manufacturer. So uh, we do have chefs from all over the world. Um, it will impact our ability to recruit people. Come to order, please. Officially, Labour is rather silent on the leak, not yet government policy. But prominent voices fear cutting off low-skilled immigration could choke business. The idea uh, that we stop EU citizens coming uh, here, the lower skilled ones who are important for hospitality, construction, social care, uh, will, will somehow lead to us being more prosperous is ridiculous. That's why I'm hoping uh, this leak isn't genuine government policy. And if it is, I'm hoping the government rethinks. Is it not time we took back control of our immigration policy? The government won't budge, though, on its view. The referendum was an instruction from the public to control immigration. Exactly how? Well, one minister admitted it won't be an easy job. And since this draft was put together only last month, there have been six more versions of the plan, with not just the Home Office, but the Treasury, the Brexit Department and Number 10, all determined to chip in. And don't forget, whatever they decide here, they have to try to persuade the EU. Leaving the EU is not just about obscure negotiations in the back rooms of Brussels, but government departments right now engaged in rewriting the country's rules. Laura Koonsberg, BBC News, Westminster. So, if this draft document is anything to go by, the government wants to cut back the number of low-skilled workers coming into Britain from the EU. But what effect would that have on our economy and services if their numbers were restricted. Here's our home editor, Mark Easton. For many, Brexit was about restricting EU immigration. Here in Clacton, for example, the support for an immigration policy that deters low-skilled European workers from coming to the UK unless it can be shown they make British people richer. Britain should come first, because it's broken Britain at the minute. They should just come over here and get in jobs straight away. It's not right. Brexit means the same rules we currently use for non-EU migrants can be applied to those from the EU. For instance, discouraging low-skilled workers. The Home Office document proposes low-skilled EU workers be limited to staying a maximum of two years, that they meet a specific salary threshold with a cap on overall numbers. But what does low-skilled mean? For non-EU, it means a job paying less than £30,000 a year. So many care workers, for example, teachers, builders and nurses, are barred unless their occupation is on a shortage list. This afternoon, nurses were demonstrating outside Parliament, demanding better pay, but also warning the NHS in England is currently 40,000 nurses short. So one of the difficulties is, because of the low pay of nurses, they don't fall into the category of those skilled workforce we want to bring in. So we've always been dependent on nursing being on a shortage list, which we would obviously encourage that um, demand that it stays on the shortage list. Inside the Houses of Parliament, MPs were today discussing how lower immigration might hit key services like social care. But those in favour of tougher controls say the UK must do more to fill British jobs with British workers. What we want to do is encourage employers to train local people actually to make more of an effort to look ahead and prepare for the time when there won't be all these uh, people coming in with uh, ready-made skills prepared to work for lower wages. Today's policy proposals also envisage tighter controls on family members an EU worker can bring with them, a minimum income for spouses, for example. But official government advisers have said post-Brexit lower immigration would cost Britain £113 million a week by 2021. Employers, including the creative industries, construction, agriculture and the hospitality industry, have been warning of dire economic consequences. Recruiting from the European market is really important to us and it adds another skill base to our workforce and that skill base is often something we just cannot get locally. Today's policy proposal document may well enjoy public support but it also highlights the swings and roundabouts of the journey to a lower migration Britain. Mark Easton, BBC News.
Now, employers have warned leaked government plans for post-Brexit controls and immigration would be catastrophic for businesses. A draft Home Office paper outlines proposals to end free movement and to deter low-skilled immigrants. Theresa May says people want greater controls on immigration, but critics say it is vital for the economy. Here's our political correspondent, Carl Dinan. Who comes to Britain after Brexit? Today's draft proposals take that choice away from employers and migrants themselves and gives it to government. Ministers will decide if immigration is not just economically but socially desirable and could cap numbers. The Prime Minister wouldn't comment on what is a leaked draft, but the document does propose ways of enacting the government's current aims. We continue to believe as a government that it's important to have migra net migration at sustainable levels. We believe that to be in the tens of thousands because of the impact particularly it has on people at the lower end of the income scale in depressing their wages. What the document suggests is that immigration must benefit existing UK residents, and that even takes priority over the economy. Unskilled workers would be able to stay for up to two years. Skilled workers could stay for five years. Immediate family members can join EU workers here, but not their extended family. And EU visitors would need passports to come, but could still travel freely. Labour's most powerful politician says the economy still needs unskilled workers. Many of the construction workers, they may be deemed lower skilled, but they're uh, EU citizens who contribute hugely to building homes that we need, but also they pay taxes and national insurance. And the idea we will kick them out, we will split up for families, will lead to all sorts of problems in relation to those families, but also an inability to build the homes we need. How many people would it be for, sir? And businesses like this hotel in Manchester are also concerned that they just won't be able to find staff. It worries us about filling the vacancies because uh, the biggest issue is that the United Kingdom is less than 5% uh, unemployment. At the moment. Where are we going to get um, the future staff from? Uh, and that's a real issue. This evening, eyebrows have been raised by a letter Downing Street has asked businesses to sign praising its handling of Brexit. Not all of them think it has been quite that good. And there remains an essential tension between the immigration controls that many voters think they have demanded and the access to workers many businesses say they need. Carl Dinan, ITV News, Westminster. It's official, sensitive and now out in the open. A draft of the government's plans for immigration from the European Union after Brexit has been leaked from the Home Office. The policies, which are still being argued about at the top of government, include quotas for low-skilled workers and telling companies they must employ resident workers unless they can show the economic need to employ an EU citizen. The document has had a frosty reception by some in Europe, although some Brexit campaigners have welcomed it. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, reports. Theresa May has pleaded for confidentiality. Someone in Whitehall had a different idea. The leaker, it's assumed, didn't like where immigration policy post-Brexit might be going. The leaked Home Office document says from the moment of Brexit, during a transition period, there'd be immediate controls on new arrivals from the EU, blocking them from staying long if they hadn't got a job. There could be quotas for low-skilled workers, capping overall numbers. Companies wanting to recruit in the EU could be required to conduct an economic needs test to prove there aren't people in the local workforce they could recruit from. This is a draft white paper on immigration policy that Theresa May had hoped would actually have been published by now. But since her general election setback, some cabinet ministers have been pushing back on what they think is too hard line in immigration policy. They worry that it means the EU won't give Britain the transitional arrangements it wants, more or less the status quo and that this kind of immigration policy could harm the final trade deal with the EU. The whole principle of the single market, which, lest we forget, was a British invention. It was Mr Thatcher who brought this in. It was based on the principle that trade isn't just about goods, it's about services, it's about capital, it's about people moving around, and you've got to treat this as a whole. And you can't just pick out one of the inconvenient bits and ignore all the others, and that's why um, the, I mean, really, the government is in a kind of fantasy world and they're not understanding the way in which the European Union has worked for decades and works today. So a hardline immigration policy post-Brexit 
will encourage a less generous trade deal from Europe, you think? I think there is a serious risk that that could happen. There are people, um, some of them cabinet ministers, who think if you go down the route of this draft document, you won't get such a good deal from Europe in trade at the end of the day. Well, I don't think they've ever been in a negotiation then if they think like that. Um, the truth is, the European Union, funny enough, is way past where some of them may be. The European Union accepts that we're leaving. They've actually banked that already. It'll let us have any immigration policy no, we like? No, well, it doesn't. They've already assumed that we will have a migration policy which is about controlled borders. So I don't think, I've not met a European politician that says, we want you to keep freedom of movement. Their answer is, unless you sign up completely to freedom of movement, then you can't be, for those who want to be in the single market, you cannot be in the single market. So they've accepted that one of the things we're doing is putting control on our borders. Whether we put a little bit of control or a great deal of control makes no difference to them. The Prime Minister at Question Time defended the idea of more controls on immigration and believes that was one of the central messages of the EU referendum vote. We're already able to exercise controls in relation to those who come to this country from outside the, uh, the countries within the European Union. And we continue to believe as a government that it's important to have migra net migration at sustainable levels. We believe that to be the tens of thousands because of the impact particularly it has on people at the lower end of the income scale in depressing their wages. Some voters today sounding closer to Theresa May's view of things than her critics. Well, the controls should be in place now. You know, they, they should be stopping immigration into the country. They say there's enough, there's enough, there's enough in the country. Deal with what you've got here first. Deal, you know, give the jobs to the British and the people that are in the country anyway. But I'm thinking, well, why are you so sort of like making these youngsters from Poland and wherever coming in? Surely, if you gave our kids a decent wage, you know, would that, in, would that? you know, make our kids, oh, I might go for that, I might go for that. Well, I feel that um, if they do stop all the um, low-skilled workers, there's not going to be enough people in our area to take over those jobs because, unfortunately, the young people don't want to be vegetable pickers or be egg collectors and things like that, so I just don't think it will work. One EU minister visiting London said Theresa May would pay a heavy price for this kind of immigration policy. Does that look to you like quite a hard-line immigration policy that Britain is thinking of post-Brexit? And does it make a deal between the EU and Britain harder or easier? The document is beyond an hard line. The document is totally unhelpful. I'm reassured on the fact that it has been presented as a draft. Uh, I'm reassured with the fact that some member of your government uh, didn't even uh, read the document. So it is not... Uh, uh, to me, the official British government uh, line. But if a policy like that did come out from Britain, what would it do to the shape of the deal between Britain and Europe? That wouldn't help at all. Migration issues, which David Cameron struggled to get the EU to move on, yet again at the centre of this saga. Well, over now to Gary in Westminster. Gary, does this document suggest Britain is a long way from where the EU wants it to be in these negotiations? I think the key immediate concern in parts of government is the transition period. Ministers believe that is what will unlock progress in the wider talks. The transition period that the government is looking at is trying to get status quo in the single market and in the customs union. And as far as the European Union is concerned, that means status quo on freedom of movement. And you ask whether we're a long way from them. I think one of the lessons of the David Cameron renegotiation attempt is that you don't have to be a long way from uh, freedom of movement for the European Union to turn around and say no. If you're 80, 90 percent of the way there, they still say no. They want 100 percent uh, freedom of movement if you're having these other arrangements. Theresa May is incredibly uncomfortable with that. And she is very unrelaxed about the idea of getting to the point of Brexit and this transitional period and not being able to tell uh, Britons, particularly those who voted leave, that there are any new controls in place. And that uh, is about where we are at the moment. And it is a very big fight inside government. Gary, thanks very much. Well, I'm joined now from Westminster by the Conservative MP Rishi Sunak and Labour's Alison McGovern. Alison McGovern, there's a lot of outrage on the left about this document, this, this plan, but surely this is exactly what the government promised or what the, what the Leave campaign promised and what people voted for in the referendum, a tough plan on immigration. 
Well, no, I think the Leave campaign was actually quite divided. Of course, people uh, in many cases were voting about immigration, but they were also told they could have 350 million quid a week for the NHS. You know, constituents of mine told me they were voting Leave to get rid of David Cameron. So I don't think it's all that clear at all. But are you and you still have to suggesting, wonder. Are you still suggesting that, that the, the government is wrong to say that this referendum was about, in part, immigration, and they have to cut immigration. I mean, surely that's Labour's problem, isn't it, in continuing well, to deny that people want immigration to be cut? No, not at all. I think that if people are worried about security and if people have got think that our economy is stacked up in the wrong way, I think they've got a point and we've got to find solutions to that. But what concerns me is this leak has been, I think, designed to distract us from an absolutely dismal performance from the Tories in terms of negotiating this Brexit. I think David Cameron had set himself against Europe and then tried to get a deal, which you can't do. And I think the Tories are now continuing in that mould, just forever stirring it up and not at all being able to get the kind of deal that will be good for British people. I think, you know, we are all very worried what on earth is going to happen to our economy. And whilst we've got to deal with people's um, concerns about security or, as I say, or pay, actually, we've got to make sure our economy doesn't fall off a cliff in the meantime. Rishi Sunak, I mean, this plan is pie in the sky, isn't it? I mean, it might be helpful for the government to talk tough on immigration in this way. But there's no chance of it being accepted as part of the EU negotiations, is there? Well, I think the first thing that's important to note is this isn't a government plan. This is a, you know, a draft of something that was written by civil servants that hasn't seen the light of day or indeed even been anywhere near the cabinet table. And I'm understood uh, that it's been revised six times since it was, this draft was written. But I think the important point is this. When we leave the European Union, we have a choice. Uh, do you want to continue with freedom of movement and stay inside the single market? Or do you want to leave it and be in control of our immigration policy? I think the broad thrust of the Conservative position is that we, we want to end free movement of people. Say, and then we have to replace that with an immigration policy well, that does choice. two simple things you know one is that it controls the amount of low-skill immigration into this country it doesn't stop it doesn't end it we don't put a wall up we're just in control of it but and at the same time we want to make sure we are open to the breasts and biters around the world say we and, have and a attract choice. them here you say we have a choice but actually it will be dictated by what is acceptable by the rest of the eu I, I, I and they won't I, buy a plan well, I don't, like this. I don't, I, I, I don't accept that at all. The EU has signed free trade deals with South Korea. It's in the process of finalising one with Canada. Uh, neither of those free trade deals contain anything close to the free movement of people at all. They want to sign a free trade deal with Japan, we've recently learned. Again, immigration is not part of any of these free trade deals. And in fact, nowhere around the world do free trade deals remain conditional on a country saying, let's open our borders to you know, your country with absolutely no controls at all. That is a very uh, odd situation. Alison, to be in, and trade and immigration are not linked issues but, anywhere Alison else. Alison McGovern? But none of this stacks up because Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary, controlled all the non EU uh, immigration to this country and she did not choose to cut it at all. Why? Because the cost to our economy would be huge. So we have to decide to make a deal here. We have to step forward and say, OK, we need to do a deal with Europe that will keep our economy going and I think lots of people who voted leave did so on the basis that the terms of trade that our country would enjoy would be the same as before. So, so none of this um, that the Tories are putting forward about um, imaginary trade deals that are not coming forward at all really stacks up and I think it's about time we stop with these games of leaking documents here and there to try and distract the British public and actually you know, the Tories have to step forward and say, what are they going to do to make a deal with the Europeans and to make sure that my constituents aren't losing their jobs in two years' time? I mean, I think, I mean, I think, what are the EU meant point. to make of all this? The fact that, you know, there is no clear strategy at the moment. Within Cabinet, we know that they are still arguing about what the immigration policy should be post-Brexit. No, I think actually we're in the process of in going into great detail on every aspect of our future relationship, both with the EU and internally what do we want our agricultural policy and our immigration policy and things like that to be. But this point that you know, no one is interested in signing a free trade deal with us, we just had Iceland say everyone wants to sign a free trade deal with you when you leave the UK. That's not me saying it, that's Iceland saying it. We've had positive noises from America, from Canada, from New Zealand, from Australia, from South Korea, from India. In fact, the rest of the world is ready and excited. We're the fifth largest economy in the world with a lot to offer. So I think actually Actually, there will be a very positive future for us outside of the EU when we get on to doing all these free trade deals. And in terms of working out the details of these policies about what we do Alison, when we leave the in. EU, we, we, we need to leave the EU. We need to leave the EU from, in order to from, actually from have Donald control Trump. of this.
those policies. At this point in time, I think I will keep my concern for my constituents' jobs and their welfare, quite honestly. You know, we were told by David Davis and others that by now we would have had secured deals and that, you know, all of this would be absolutely clear, and it isn't. And in fact, when it comes to making policy for the future of our country. The government this week is trying to rob Parliament of its powers to regulate industry and to set policy for this country and they're trying to um, just get Parliament to rubber stamp Alison, a massive transfer of powers Alison and that Govern is because they're insecure and they know they can't win the argument. Alison Governor and Rishi Sunak, I'm sorry we're going to have to end it there but thank you very much. Thank you. Well, back now to our main news tonight, those leaked documents revealing government plans for a tough new immigration regime after Brexit. All but the most highly skilled EU workers would only be allowed to stay for two years, with possible quotas to follow. The proposals, which haven't yet been officially approved, are already alarming business groups who've described them as catastrophic. And there's also been an angry reaction to Downing Street's effort to get Britain's biggest businesses to swing behind their Brexit strategy. Across fields and farms, restaurants and pubs, British businesses have got used to an easy flow of European workers and argue that this flexible labour force helps them grow. But the government knows many voted for Brexit because they were concerned by the levels of immigration, particularly from Eastern Europe. There are now 2.2 million EU nationals working in the UK labour market. That's 7% of the total. 9% of retail and leisure workers are from the EU. It's the same share in construction and a little higher in manufacturing. So the government wants to discourage EU workers coming into the country while pushing UK companies to fill their jobs with local workers. There are currently more than three quarters of a million vacancies. But with the employment rate at its highest since records began and unemployment at its lowest since 1975, some companies may wonder where these local workers are going to come from. Well, earlier I spoke to Fraser Nelson, Spectator editor, and Nadra Ahmed, who used to run care homes and is now the executive chairman of the National Care Association. And I began by asking her what she thought of today's proposals. Well, I think we have to understand that um, the social care sector, health and social care, um, are already challenged about the recruitment and retention of um, care staff. Something like this will further destabilise it. We've got to really be clear that we will be looking for another one million workers over the next five years in order to meet the demographics of older people. And for some reason, over the last decade and a half, we've not been able to encourage um, people from within the UK to take those roles on. And so we've been heavily reliant on workers from abroad. And so in, our, in order to fulfil that, we must be very, very careful about the messages we're currently sending out. OK, Fraser Nelson, you say that the shortage of workers could actually be a good thing. Why? Well, in some respects, I mean, in the last um, sort of 10, 12 years, employers have rapidly availed themselves of, of EU labour. It's been brilliant for employers, lots of very highly dedicated, industrious and not terribly expensive people coming in to help companies grow. Now, this has been great from many um, perspectives, but one of the side effects is that you have to ask, have British people been trained as much as they might otherwise be? The incentive to train them isn't as high if you can get fully trained people from abroad. If you look at British salaries as well. They've been stagnant for quite some time now. And certainly you hear the care sector, other sectors say that if immigration is going to drop, then their, their wage pressures might increase. Now, that is true. Prices might go up. But you also have to ask, is it such a bad thing if wage pressures increase? Is it such a bad thing if employers have to go to extra lengths to recruit, to entice, and even to train the people for the kind of jobs that they need? OK, Nadra Ahmed, why don't you just recruit British workers and pay them more? If you look at the job uh, vacancies, in any job centre you will see social care jobs being advertised on a regular basis. We just do not get people coming forward. The image of social care has been so damaged in this country that we are not finding people readily available to come and even give it a chance. So we are trying that. You know, going abroad and recruiting staff is not the first port of call. It is usually done when we cannot get people 
people to fill the jobs. And of course, by regulatory uh, requirements, we are required to have a certain number of staff within our uh, establishments to meet the needs of the vulnerable people. Quite rightly so. Fraser Nelson, there are no British people to do these jobs. You've just heard there someone from the care sector saying they are not queuing up to become care workers. Where are we going to find all these people? Well, it was a little bit missing there. Perhaps they're not queuing up to become care workers at the salaries being offered. Perhaps those salaries, which are not exactly famously high in the health and social care sector, ought to be a bit better. I can't think of any important, more important resource in, uh, in health and social care than the people who are around looking after the sick and the infirm. Surely that ought to be where you put most of your investment. Now, the thing is that there is a skills shortage in Britain in general. The employment is um, doing pretty well. But wages have not gone up. This is a huge problem in our economy. And as if employers are saying it's outrageous that they might even have to consider putting up wages a bit more, paying when they're struggling to find people, struggling to fill jobs. I'm not so sure it's such a bad thing. Nadra Ahmed, you were shaking your head there, what Fraser Nelson was saying. I just think it's maybe we're living in parallel universes because actually when we look at the social care sector and we, we've looked at the last general election, the manifestos, the challenges that were faced, it has been clearly evidence that social care is not being funded properly. We are paying what is the national living wage. The vast majority of providers are paying more than that in order to get the staff that they um, uh, that they want and over and above that we are training them we're trying to recruit them they do not stay in the role for very long because it is a very challenging and stressful role it is a skilled role now we are delivering health care needs now we are looking after people who are dying we are looking after people with strokes parkinson's all those conditions which people think are health conditions but they're actually in our services and yet we're not being funded to do that and nobody wants to tackle that issue. It's very easy to blame the sector for not paying um, a, 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 a wage that people feel that they ought to. Providers themselves want to be paying that. When I was a provider I wanted to be paying much more than I was paying. I think you need to go and look at the evidence sir. So, Fraser Nelson, isn't it the case that you are not listening to evidence from employers, from those in these sectors, because you and perhaps indeed the government are obsessed with this jingoistic mantra of British jobs for British workers? Well, I'm not obsessed with it. I'm quite a liberal on uh, immigration. And nobody's saying we're going to be fewer immigrants. We're going to get tens of thousands more immigrants every single year. And the economy needs them. And I don't see, I don't think anybody is really contesting that. Uh, but I do look at something else other than the cries of employers. I look at the way that wages in this country have been stagnant for a decade. That is a really, really big problem here. And if it's the case that employers are having to pay more, then that is the solution to way we've got to one of the biggest problems in our society right now is wages that are far too low. I mean, I, I can imagine the job of a care worker. It's incredibly difficult. Well, one of my cousins is a care worker. And I have to tell you, he doesn't get paid anywhere near enough for the incredibly hard work that he does. So I think if human Humans are becoming a lot more scarce. I think that's a good thing because it's time to pay the humans a bit more. But Fraser Nelson, this is not about multinationals. This is about public sector workers. And in the end, if you're calling for higher wages, it's taxpayers who are going to pick up the bill. Yes, and perhaps taxpayers and consumers should pick up the bill for higher wages. If we have a skilled workforce that's capable of doing more, that's how economies are supposed to function. And I think that a focus on the skills gap, a focus on people, is long overdue after a decade of stagnant wages. We'll have to leave it there. Fraser Nelson and Nazra Ahmed, thank you both very much. It's been just 24 hours since the Home Office plans for immigration post-Brexit was leaked by The Guardian. Under the draft plans, firms would have to recruit locally unless they could prove an economic need to employ EU citizens. Now, we must emphasise the government has said these plans are just a draft, and since it was put together, there have been six more versions of the document. Still, firms that rely on EU workers have warned of the catastrophic impact of the proposals and the massive disruption they will cause to UK business. David Grossman has been taking a look. How many coffees, how many experiments, and how much fruit did EU migrants provide Britain with today? The Brexit vote, though, showed that for many voters, the rate and scale of EU migration has been too great. How to cut it without doing real damage to the economy is a difficult balancing act. 
Thanks to a leak of a policy document obtained by The Guardian, we have clues now as to what Whitehall is thinking. It is only a draft. I suspect it will go through a few changes yet, but it's broadly on the right lines. It's to be welcomed if implemented as proposed, then we see a considerable significant reduction in the sort of numbers coming from the EU, which is what people broadly voted for a year and a bit ago. According to the document, the unrestricted flows of EU migrants will come to an end. In the future, they'll be filtered to allow in only those who make a valuable contribution. In effect, three filters will be applied on skills, on salary and on social impact. To be considered valuable to the country as a whole, says the leak, immigration should benefit not just the migrants themselves, but also make existing residents better off. Prime Minister, is your immigration policy going to hurt the economy? The government says it won't comment on the substance of the leak. We are told this is an old draft. But on the principles, Theresa May was very clear in the comments today. Post-Brexit, much will have to change. We continue to believe as a government that it's important to have migra net migration at sustainable levels. We believe that to be the tens of thousands because of the impact particularly it has on people at the lower end of the income scale in depressing their wages. However, some economists say there's little evidence that EU migrants suppress wages. Britain needs overseas workers, they say, because unemployment is low and there's no obvious alternative to those EU workers. Employers that we've spoken to have talked about targeting ex-offenders, um, women going back to the labour market after a period out of, out of work. Um, they, talk, they always talk about school leavers, so they're desperately trying um, to tap into those sources of labour. But the fact is that those sectors have always employed migrants. They've always been unattractive um, to British workers. And so it's hard to see how any, any group or even any set of groups is going to meet employers' needs if there was a reduction in the EU migration. Workers would, according to the document, be treated differently based on their level of skill. Higher skilled workers will have the chance to come to the UK for three to five years, whilst lower skilled workers will just have two years residency and rights to bring family members could be restricted. Employers who still have to recruit low skilled workers from abroad might have to pay a skills tax to help train UK workers. The implication then is that employers might have to just pay a bit more to attract UK workers. None of our research suggests uh, that the reason we can't get workers is because of pay. There are cultural issues why UK workers don't want to do some of these jobs, and sure, we can work on that. Uh, and there might be scope in the future for looking at automation and technology as an answer to replacing some of these jobs. But the facts on the ground are uh, that overseas workers, currently primarily from the EU, uh, make up a lot, of these, uh, a, a lot of these jobs, and agriculture and horticulture really relies on them at the moment. And even in high skill sectors like science and research that will supposedly be favoured in the new immigration system, there's concern. Our scientific workforce here in the UK is made up of a wide range of people uh, from all over the world and of a really wide spectrum of different talents and skills from the uh, technicians and from the early career researchers right through to the professors and the CEOs. Um, the risk of putting uh, salary and, and other criteria like qualifications on a migration system is that you may inadvertently uh, cut out access to the UK from some of those people. Um, you could have a PhD in science and be uh, extremely expert in your field and not meet the government's current salary threshold for uh, migrants from outside the EU, which is around £21,000 a year. Immigration is where two Brexit realities collide, one economic, one political. Picking its way through this is one of the most significant challenges the government faces. David Grossman reporting with our political editor, Nick Watt, is here. Well, Nick, this has caused quite a reaction this week. That's right. Sadiq Khan, the London mayor, said it would strangle the London economy. And Nikki Morgan, the former Tory education secretary, saying that she is concerned about it. The significance of this is this is the first definitive account of how the UK will seek to control immigration when we've definitively left the EU. And as David Grossman was saying there, it will be a relatively benign system for higher skilled workers, but there will be more restrictions for lower skilled workers. Now, it was interesting. 
interesting today. Jeremy Corbyn was silent on this. And I spoke to a number of Remain Tories, sort of pro-European Tories, and one sort of pro-European member of the Cabinet said to me, they hope that when people look at this, mm -hmm. they'll see that it's not that bad. It's quite soft and it seeks to answer that dilemma that David Grossman was talking about there. How do you take back control of immigration? How do you bring the numbers down but do it in a way that does not harm the economy? But one thing I have learnt this evening, one idea in this early draft that has been absolutely rejected is that in the transition period, that's a period immediately after we leave the EU, there is an idea for EU citizens who want to stay in the UK for a little longer than a short visit would have to give their fingerprints. I spoke to a senior member of the Cabinet, said absolutely no way that is out. OK, well, what about uh, the whole idea of transition arrangements? What does the document actually tell us that's surviving at least this iteration? Yeah. Well, overlooked in this document, in the reporting of it, but in plain sight, is the most detailed account of how the government will deal and manage with this transitional period, which is officially known as the implementation phase. Now, ministers have been quite cagey about saying how long this will last. Well, in this document, it says that it will last for at least least two years and on the rules for migration in that transition period they hug the rules on EU free movement very closely. It talks about how you'd have to register. That's consistent with EU law. In fact, that is the rule that applies in Germany. And it's interesting, there is a cabinet committee that oversees this negotiation, six members of it. They recently agreed that there should be this transition, which is following on from the implementation phase outlined in Theresa May's Lancaster House speech. They didn't agree the timing, but what I've learnt is that Boris Johnson is pushing pushing back and he's saying make sure this lasts no longer than one year. That's not what is in this document. On well, next day, Pooks, I want to come back to you. Uh, one of the key sectors that could be affected by these leaked proposals is hospitality and tourism. 4.6 million people work in the industry, an estimated 700,000 of which are from the European Union. Joining us now is Ufi Ibrahim, the Chief Executive of the British Hospitality Association. Good evening to you. Good evening. I know that um, uh, the hospitality industry has been kicking up today, but you would say that, wouldn't you? Because in a sense, uh, a lot of what you do survives on cheap labour, and a lot of European nationals are prepared to come and work for the lowest of wages within the law. Well, the Prime Minister today actually talked about the pressing wages by employing EU nationals, but there is no evidence to support that. In fact, the evidence would suggest otherwise. And the truth of the matter is, the fact is, that in the United Kingdom at the moment, we have the lowest level of unemployment that we have had for the past 40 years. Any further sudden or material change to the supply of labour to the UK workforce would be significantly damaging for an industry yeah. that already finds it very difficult to find people to actually employ here well, in the British workforce. But perhaps it's because um, the conditions are not attractive enough in the sense that there isn't enough sort of support and training. And actually, it's, I would put it to you that perhaps the hospitality industry has been quite lazy, actually, because there are half a million unemployed between 18 and the, 18 and the ages 18 and 24. And actually, you could encourage them more, certainly through FE colleges, certainly through on the job training but actually it's easier to pick up an incredibly enthusiastic person from Europe who speaks three languages and is prepared to work long hours and for as I say low pay. Well as an industry we reject the argument that the British individual is not attracted to work in our industry. Well and what are you doing to attract them? Our industry employs 3.2 million people directly in the United Kingdom, 700,000 of which are EU nationals. But 75% of waiters are from out with the UK. Just coming back to the, to the original question, in our industry we have serious numbers of people who started out at the entry level and have made it up to being the senior executives in the business. In fact, two-thirds of all of the senior level executives in our industry started with very little qualifications, very little experience and started at that low level, which proves the point that our industry is actually one of the great meritocracies of the United but, Kingdom. So therefore you don't really huge need... Huge training possibilities, huge uh, development uh, possibilities. And, 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 and indeed, um, that's exactly the opposite to, to one of the contributors of the film, said they find it very hard to attract UK-born uh, people to these jobs. It suggests that actually, with a bit more effort, you could actually employ, as it were, British people in British jobs. 
I think the reality is that all businesses, including the hospitality industry, have come to rely on the strategic advantage of being able to have an EU workforce. That is an absolute reality. Mm. But it's yeah, also and, and, and I, the, the, the experience of most people, I would suggest, is that the, you know, those workers are extremely good. But the point is that's allowed you to really sit back and say, we're not going to do as much as we could do. Because you're talking now about taking 10 years to, as it were, fill the gap. But actually, you've known now for what, since last June, you've been accelerating what you do to attract local workforce? Well, actually, for the past three years, we have been the only industry in the United Kingdom leading campaigns like the Big Conversation, which have mm. actually created 67,000 new career starts for British youngsters under the age of 25. There are very few industries in the United Kingdom that have gone the extra mile to be able to attract those sorts of individuals. But the point here is that in the United Kingdom, there is a fundamental issue around vocational education. Mm. Government cannot push the whole burden onto mm. the private sector. Government must accept responsibility. So what do you want the government to do to and change the way that that kind of education is delivered? So, at the same time as launching any proposal for immigration policy, the government of the United Kingdom must ensure that they consider a whole holistic mix of policies that will be required to ensure that industries like ours will not be harmed. And that includes educational policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Department for Education must come forward and propose ways in which they will promote vocational education. Mm -hmm. And I just want to give you an example of something which we're very concerned about. We were dismayed when the T-levels were announced. And the mm -hmm. government then said that they were actually postponing the introduction of T-levels in the United Kingdom to 2019. Mm -hmm. T-levels being the vocational mm -hmm. um, channel, if you like, equivalent to A-levels to prepare a workforce for industries like ours. That's now been postponed to 2019. And further concern, they've said that our industry is not going to be integrated into the T-levels in the first round. So how is it possible that a government that is serious about making Brexit a success is not willing to provide the whole mix of policies that industries like ours will need to be able to do that? If it, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And now, Nick, what is still with us? And the EU withdrawal bill hits the Commons again tomorrow. What's going to happen? Well, first day of debate tomorrow. Vote for the second reading on Monday night. Monday night, I think it's highly likely that it will get its second reading. Labour will vote against it. But the Tory Remainers, the pro-Europeans, they're keeping their powder dry for when the bill is considered at committee stage after the conference season in October. And interestingly, it had been assumed that that might be the high noon moment when they try to amend the bill to sort of put single market sort of elements in there. They are not going to do that. They are going to concentrate on one key area, what they regard as a power grab by the government. This is when this, all this EU law is brought onto the UK statute book, where there are thousands of regulations that might need to be tweaked. They're going to be done through the so-called Henry VIII clauses, i.e. by ministers without a debate in Parliament. They're going to focus on that. Tory rips, whips reasonably confident that they should survive this and it should go through in October. I'll show you back tomorrow, Nick. Thank you.